Merry meet my fellow bookish witches. Welcome to Witchy Reads, a place where we talk about books and other bookish things. It is no secret that middle grade is the underrated gem of the literary community. It doesn't get nearly enough praise compared to its YA and new adult counterparts. Honestly, I think that is a failing on publishers and readers. It's one of the reasons why I've tried looking more into middle grade, what it can offer and what sets it apart. For one thing, there is no other genre that can pull off a story of dark whimsy the way a middle grade book can. Just look at Alice in Wonderland or The Wizard of Oz. Each of these is a coming of age tale that presents the fantasy of childhood while subtly introducing the darkness of adulthood in an age-appropriate way. This is where middle grade can be utilized a lot more. But I don't want to go among mad people. Oh, you can't help that. Most everyone's mad here. <laughs> Dark whimsy is a genre of story that is made up of elements that are magical and lighthearted, sinister and darkly realistic. What usually makes these stories whimsical are the quirky characters, obscure settings, and deep lore surrounded by the magical or supernatural. These stories are usually influenced by fables, folk tales, and mythology. These darker plots can include horror, the macabre, and more mortality that alludes to or directly addresses real world struggles. A similar genre is magical realism, how it mingles fantasy and reality and the mysteries of the world by commenting on society as a whole. Magical realism stories are primarily set in the real world, but have fantastical elements that are seen as normal. These elements are then used to comment on and critique society. It is also not a requirement of magical realism to have the characters be quirky or whimsical. So a lot of characters in these types of stories just aren't. This is where the key difference lies. Stories of dark whimsy are set in fantasy worlds, either separate from our world or existing in the world as we know it. Within these fantasy worlds, whimsical characters are made to face and sometimes overcome the criticism and cynicism of society. Readers, especially young readers, are drawn to this genre for a myriad of reasons. The key point seems to be that life itself is dark and difficult. Dark whimsy takes heavy yet relatable topics such as anxiety, mortality, relationships, self-esteem, and uncertainty and makes them far more palatable. These stories don't spoon feed us answers, sometimes don't even give us a comforting conclusion, but for a brief time they give us something equally as important, the sense that we are not alone. The Scarecrow was possibly the most frightening thing Aaron had ever dreamt up, but here it was, dancing around, acting like a silly child. The Last Scarecrow by Neil J. Hart is a middle grade coming of age tale that has a touch of darkness, placing it perfectly within the dark whimsy genre. The story follows Aaron, a precocious preteen girl who delights in the strange and unusual. This fascination manifests in her creations, her scarecrows, that stand guard at her family farm. Our first encounter with Erin is as she and her family are desperately trying to survive the many years storm, a long and brutal weather event that floods 90% of the earth and kills 99% of the humans that used to inhabit it. From the outside looking in, it appears that the only human left alive is Erin. Her parents are dead and her brother Clyde is missing, either lost adrift on the endless blue 
or dead. Erin wants to search for him, but she is trapped alone on the hillside of her family farm. Her only companion is her lone remaining scarecrow that wasn't swept away. Number 12, the most horrifying, grotesque looking of her scarecrow creations. On the day the many years storm ends, Erin's 12th scarecrow miraculously becomes sentient, much to the horror and delight of Erin. The scarecrow calls herself 12. She is remarkably sweet and un undeniably loyal to Aaron. We also meet the talking blackbird called Raven, who seems to have a pessimistic view of the world for good reason. What with mountain peaks being made into hills, skyscrapers that have turned into small cubes surrounded by the endless blue ocean that is now this world's new reality. It is into this haunting new world that Aaron, Twelve, and Raven set sail on a boat that Twelve builds from scrap materials remaining on the farm. Erin on the search for her missing brother Clyde. Twelve on the lookout for her lost sisters. Erin's eleven other scarecrow creations that were swept away during the many years storm. This world has changed far more than just being flooded. With humans gone, other animals and creatures have risen and are fighting for dominance over the endless blue. The first interaction Erin has with this new normal is when when she and her companions come to the Isle of Trees. It is here that they find Five, Aaron's fifth scarecrow, who has the voices of thousands of souls swimming in her head. Not a great situation, especially when her solution to this problem is to create men out of the reeds, sticks, and mud around the island, stick those souls one by one into these dark weed creations. These are the Wicker Men. They have a theory about how they exist. The voices in Five's head are the human souls of all who have died. Like most humans, I would imagine, they want to return to their human bodies. In order to do this, they must deliver the last remaining human girl to the patchwork woman who resides on Boot Hill. A powerful, evil creature of magic who wants to rule what remains of the world. Aaron seems to be the key to doing that. Luckily, Aaron and Twelve manage to escape with the help of Jack, one of the Wickermen, sadly lose Raven in the process. Now with their new companion, they have to find a way to not only avoid the patchwork woman, but find allies to stop her crusade. You need to go right now. What the hell is wrong with you? It's really not hard to understand why we are most drawn to stories that follow young, resilient protagonists. This is especially true when the story is dark and whimsical. Think Neil Gaiman's Coraline or Chihiro in Spirited Away. We love seeing these kinds of characters face difficult circumstances, uncovering secrets with a sense of whimsical optimism and brash determination that ultimately allows them to win the day. Not without some scars and growing along the way. This is the part of fairy tales that give children the chance to name and face their fears, to make sense of the world around them. It's easy to see why children are often drawn to these stories as they are some of the few who take them seriously, presenting the story at their level while not looking down on them, to trust them to be capable of not only understanding but being the one to overcome the obstacles in these stories. They see themselves in these protagonists through the use of humor, magic, and of course, weirdness. It is fair to say that this is the definitive genre with the unrivaled ability to make heavier themes, issues, and questions more accessible to a younger demographic of readers. As adults, we tend to forget why dark whimsy is so important to the growth of children, teaching them that we are not alone as we navigate our paths in the world, that even things that appear sinister aren't actually. Villains or unsettling situations are not as scary or hard to overcome as they may seem at first. Even if something or someone is bad, with enough lightheartedness, enough whimsy, we can provide balance, come out the other side of the journey smarter and stronger. Yes, I am confident. Then you don't need us anymore. But then you'd never have had such an adventure, Marshall said. An adventure filled with excitement and wonder and heartache and death. 
Aaron, 12, and Jack make their way to Clifftop, the home of the rest of the birds, where Bavorsky Beetlestone is in charge. All the birds seem to hold a grudge against the inhabitants of the Scrapers, fighting for control over the endless blue ocean. In order to take down the patchwork woman, the birds begrudgingly send Aaron and 12 as envoys to form an alliance with the Scrapers. Part of this is returning Socks, the dog, to his original owner, the king of the Scrapers, also known as the Blue King, as a sort of peace offering. When our group of characters arrive at the Scrapers, they are encountered by an army of sentient mannequins who are ruled by the Blue King. As it turns out, is not a mannequin at all, but a young boy named Marshall, who went along with the King title so as not to be killed by the mannequins. This was probably the most terrifying part of the story for me, from Marshall describing describing how the mannequins lined up the remaining humans seeking shelter in the skyscrapers to be killed execution style while he hid in a coat closet, to the mannequins jumping into the ocean to raid the drowned department stores from which they came for weapons and supplies. We also get to see the drowned mannequins who were labeled unbelievers, those who didn't believe the Blue King was one of them, and were punished by his second in command, a mannequin that Mark Marshall happens to also be terrified of. Marshall is done being the Blue King. He wants to join Aaron and Twelve. To do this, he has to escape the mannequins undetected. This fails immediately as his second-in-command begins a war against Marshall, Aaron, Twelve, and Jack. All seems lost as they are easily overpowered by the amount of mannequins until those unbelievers are rescued by Twelve and they surprisingly come to Marshall's aid. Our small group of characters characters just barely manages to escape. But unfortunately, Twelve is exhausted by the exertion she took in helping in this fight and needs to rest. So Jack takes over rowing slash steering their boat. Instead of returning to Cold Harbor Farm, which was the plan to regroup and reassess their situation, Jack intentionally takes them to Boot Hill, directly into the patchwork woman's clutches. Boot Hill, as it turns out, is a cemetery on top of a hill. The patchwork woman is exactly what you think she is, a grotesque patchwork of body parts to give her a human form. With the forces of the Wickermen, the patchwork woman imprisons 12 in her fortress while taking Aaron and Marshall back to Cold Harbor Farm. Her end goal is to have Aaron make her an army of scarecrows. Then once Aaron serves her purpose, the patchwork woman will take her skin as her own. However, Aaron has grown during this journey, no longer the scared young girl who is powerless. She has seen what true power is through the love and sacrifice in 12. To fight back, Aaron stays true to her word and creates the scarecrows for the patchwork woman, with some enhancements, namely making them explosive from the penny bombs her brother secretly kept hidden in his room. When Aaron fails at animating the new scarecrows, the patchwork woman pulls out five, who she captures from the Isle of Trees. She uses the souls that are still trapped in five to animate these scarecrows that Aaron has dressed to look like a high school football team. This works, and every soul that enters the new scarecrows are ready and willing to be loyal to the patchwork woman. But the patchwork woman wants more than a high school football team's worth of scarecrows. She wants an army. Aaron ends up being more valuable as the creator of scarecrows, so the new body that the patchwork woman will inhabit is Marshall's. Her plan is to basically boil him to death in a bathtub over a bonfire, which is horrifying to think about. And I question if this would actually work because I think this would absolutely damage his skin, which seems to be the thing she wants most. Now there is a time limit for Aaron to activate her plan. Thankfully, this is when 12 reappears with reinforcements. The birds of Clifftop and the mannequins of the scrapers. The battle is intense and things start to go crazy when the football scarecrows begin to explode from Aaron's hidden explosives, one of which ends up singeing the patchwork woman's skin, revealing her to be another of Aaron's missing scarecrows. 
Number eight, made from a plastic skeleton filled with doll heads. This imagery of this scarecrow was way more horrifying than 12, but that's just me. 12 is basically a pirate that has a bison for a head. I think she looks absolutely cool. The patchwork woman, now eight, refuses to believe that she is one of Aaron's scarecrows, even though it is the truth. In the scuffle of battle, Aaron manages to save Marshall and Socks. Yes, Socks is still here and alive. Twelve and Eight end up fighting each other. During their battle, an explosive takes out Twelve's bottom half. This is when Five steps up and takes out the patchwork woman. Five souls against Eight's evil magic. The battle ends with the football scarecrows being massacred and the patchwork woman being defeated by the power of the souls within Five. Unfortunately, this also ends up killing Five. The farm is a a mess. Luckily, the mannequins and birds stick around to help Aaron clean things up. Twelve is left to get around using an old wheelchair. She doesn't want to be the last scarecrow, but doesn't have the energy to continue their adventure to find her remaining scarecrow sisters. Aaron's solution is to create one more scarecrow. A brother scarecrow, 13, and also Clyde. This one isn't just for Twelve. It's for Aaron too. With this, Twelve is ready to finally rest, knowing that Aaron is no longer alone and that she is no longer the last scarecrow. You can sleep now, Twelve. A good long sleep. You deserve it. And you can dream. Dream as big and as wild and as carefree as you dare. Dream yourself all the way to the stars. She kissed Twelve on the forehead and pinned a new badge to her lapel. Girls rule the world. The thing that shines through in this story is how Aaron, as a young girl, handles grief and darkness in her own particular way. How she uses it to grow and accept the new world she now lives in. Her positivity does take a hit a few times throughout the book, but there is never a slump if that makes sense. I would describe her reaction to each setback as her taking a punch, absorbing that force and throwing it back twofold. I loved Erin as a character. Even though she is strong, there were still moments where we are harshly reminded that she is still in fact a child. This is the kind of character development that makes dark whimsy in middle grade so profound for readers, especially readers in that middle school age range. The world building was incredible in this story. You feel the vastness of this endless blue ocean, just how much the world has changed. When the Isle of Trees is described as just being a mountain peak barely poking out of the water, is insane to think about, along with these small skyscrapers that used to be these momentous buildings. The Patchwork Woman was a proper villain that would definitely terrified children and very much gave me the same ick factor as the other mother from Coraline with a Frankenstein's monster aesthetic. But she is still defeated. It is still possible to beat her, and that is important for children to understand. Heck, even I thought she was scary until Aaron started not seeing her as a threat, which is another important thing to do with a villain in a middle grade dark whimsy story. Having some fear for kids is fine, as long as there is a point where the main character overcomes that fear and allows the reader to do the same. It really is an effective way to teach dark subjects. The Last Scarecrow succeeded in this. There were some minor plot issues, but nothing so egregious as to ruin the enjoyment I took from the story. I rated The Last Scarecrow by Neil J. Hart 4.25 stars. I'm interested in seeing if this will turn into a series or if he plans on maybe writing other stories within this world. What was the dark whimsy story you grew up with? Do you have a favorite middle grade book? Let me know down in the comments below. If you like my videos and would like to support my channel, the best way to do that right now is to like this video, subscribe to my channel, and share any videos that you particularly like. It really is a huge help and I greatly appreciate it. Until our next chapter together, merry part and blessed be.